Um, <clears throat> okay, um, I think we should get going. Uh, it looks like there are already a lot of people here, which is great to see. Thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm Ari Brostoff. I am the culture editor at Jewish Currents. And um, I have with me on the screen, uh, Laura Marsh, who is the literary editor of The New Republic, and Ruth Franklin, who is a book critic and also a former editor at The New Republic. Uh, she's the author of books including Shirley Jackson, A Rather Haunted Life, which was the 2016 recipient of the National Book Critics Circle Award for Biography. Um, we were originally going to be joined by Perul Segal, uh, the book critic at the New York Times. And unfortunately, uh, Perul is dealing with a family emergency and is not going to be able to make it tonight. Um, so we are without her, but um, we um, will have a really good conversation, I think. Um, uh, and I imagine that most of you um, who've come to this probably know a lot of um, uh, the outline, at least, of um, the, the events that we're going to be speaking about. Um, but just as kind of a refresher, uh, we're, we're here to talk about um, the troubling events that surrounded the publication earlier this spring of the authorized biography of Philip Roth, which was taken out of circulation by its publisher, W.W. W. Norton, uh, just weeks after publication, once <clears throat> it became public knowledge that several women had alleged that Bailey, the biographer, uh, had, uh, uh, Blake Bailey, sorry, the biographer, had groomed them when he worked as an eighth grade English teacher in New Orleans uh, and or sexually assaulted them later as adults. Um, the details of the allegations, as well as the fact that Norton seems to have known about some of them for longer than they let on, um, are quite disturbing in their own right. Uh, but it is also true that such accusations as well as institutional support for alleged perpetrators uh, are all too commonplace. And so um, it's, not, it's, it's not necessarily obvious that just on its own, this would become a sort of matter of public conversation, um, given that Bailey, you know, I, I think is a, 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 a somewhat high profile biographer. He's written um, biographies of writers like John Cheever and uh, Richard Yates, uh, but he's not, uh, he's not a household name, right? Like he's, um, I, I, I at least had not heard of him um, prior to the publication of this biography and everything that followed. Um, so, so the reason that this has become uh, a matter of public conversation um, is that the allegations against Bailey and the fate of this book, um, uh, which which remains uh, out of circulation, at least for now. Um, we could talk more about. I, I mean, it, it definitely is 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 um, has been dropped by W. W. Norton, um, and that's you know that is that is permanent. Um, uh, the the fate of um, of the book and these accusations. Um, have become a matter of public interest because they inevitably bear on our understanding of Philip Roth um, in ways both material and imaginative. Um, and, you know, why or if we should care about Roth in his own right uh, is a different question that I don't want to totally lose sight of here, uh, but I think maybe we can kind of work our way there. Um, so um, I will... Uh, move on to, um, to, to asking uh, our participants to, um, to jump in and we'll just say by way of, um, uh, of introducing them specifically in terms of um, uh, why I thought of them um, for this event tonight, um, as well as, as Pearl Segal who couldn't make it is that in the midst of a lot of pretty uncritical reception of uh, 
Bailey's biography when it came out in early April. Um, uh, Laura wrote a review that was um, that was quite critical and I think quite um, prescient um, uh, of the biography, um, uh, as did Pearl Segal. Uh, Ruth Franklin did not review the biography, actually had the opportunity to and, and didn't for reasons that I think she could perhaps talk more about. Um, but, uh, but she wrote an essay after um, the allegations came out and after the book was taken out of circulation um, that I, I think got into a lot of the questions surrounding this entire situation. Um, and so I think, so, so I'm sort of imagining this as uh, a kind of conversation uh, among feminist critics about a situation that um, really raised a, uh, many questions about the sexual politics of biography, um, uh, the question of who gets access to archives, um, uh, questions again about Roth himself, um, a writer that many of us, for better or for worse, um, care about, and um, and so that's so that's sort of the frame of this event. Um, so I will um, turn it over to Ruth and Laura now, and I, um, I I actually wanted to start with a question for Ruth, which is um, Ruth as a as a biographer yourself, um, and as someone who has written sort of about the politics of biography. Um, can you can you talk about, can you just explain what an authorized biography is um, as opposed to, because that's, that's sort of a um, actually like focal point, it seems to me, of uh, this whole situation that um, it's not just that that Bailey was like any old guy who sought to write about Roth, um, he was the authorized biographer and that that means something in general and it also meant something quite specific in this case. So I'm wondering if you can talk about that. Sure, um, well, yeah, thanks for this introduction and for laying out the issues so um, clearly and succinctly. So yeah, unfortunately there's not a simple and easy answer to this question. Like there's not a one size fits all of what's an authorized biography versus an unauthorized biography. And in fact, my suspicion is that the majority of biographies fall somewhere in between. Um, and so I'll just explain what that means. Um, so, you know, you said it's not like any, he's any old guy coming along writing a biography of Paul Brock. Unfortunately, you know, as I got out a bit in the op-ed I wrote about this, that's just not the way biography works. Um, it's exceedingly difficult for a random person to come along and publish a biography based on public access materials. Now it does happen, um, but the far more likely scenario, especially um, in the case of a living author, which Philip Roth was, you know, I think eight or nine years ago when Blake Bailey started working on this book, um, is that uh, the biographer needs to seek permission. And if it's not um, permission for access to the person themselves, then it's permission for access to an archive. Um, and so I'll just, I'll give an example from my own case. I wrote a biography of Shirley Jackson um, that was technically unauthorized in that you know, it wasn't official. And I'll say also that the part of what goes along with this, with this idea of authorization, which is that um, in the case of Blake Bailey, it's Roth um, picked him quite specifically for you know reasons. Some of which reasons which we know and others that we can only guess at, um, um, select, hand selected him and chose him um, to be the recipient of privileged material. And so um, normally that would include access to an archive that was likely closed to other researchers, it might include private papers that aren't held in a public archive, um, the subject or the subject's estate, more often it is um, person's descendants or whoever who are working on their behalf um, might, you know, encourage friends and other associates to turn over letters and other types of material to a specific and authorized biographer. 
Um, and usually there's nothing is said at the time about what's going to be done with these materials after the biography has been written. Now we know in the case of um, Blake Bailey's biography of Claude that he was given access to a lot of apparently sensitive material written by friends and associates of Roth who um, um, it appeared that the estate was uh, what wanted to have to show them only to Blake Bailey and then was likely going to destroy them or otherwise make them inaccessible to researchers afterwards. I think even for um, less sensitive materials in Roth's archive, the idea is that they would then be closed after the publication of this biography for something like the next 30 years. Um, so, you know, we're talking about um, stuff that truly is not available and accessible to the public. Now, you know, okay, so why doesn't everybody just say, I'm gonna write an authorized biography and have access to everything I need? The, the reality is that it's complicated and that often authorized biographers have to make some kind of compromise in order to have access to that material. They might um, have to allow the estate a final approval over the manuscript, for example. Um, there might be um, subjects that are put on you know, on or off the table, depending on what the estate or the subject is willing to have included. And um, this happened actually, um, you know, I think five or six years ago in the case of Mark Whitaker's biography of Bill Cosby, which was written um, very much with Cosby's cooperation it was an authorized biography. And it came out something like six months or so after that book was published, maybe a little bit more, I don't have a timeline in my head the allegations of all the things that Bill Cosby had done to women came out, um, which were not addressed in this book at all. And the result was, you know, that this book was discredited because obviously the biographer had, um, you know, made some kind of deal with Bill Cosby, at least so it seemed, um, you know, that the, the access came out of price as, you know, as access often does, right, in journalism, that just like, in biography. Um, so what's much more common, so the, this, the disadvantage then of writing a totally unauthorized biography is that you won't have access to these private materials. You're only going on the on what you can find yourself, you know, in terms of interviews with people, um, what, you know, public record, um, papers you can dig up on your own. And I think, you know, there's the fear that the, the picture you paint will inevitably be incomplete or, you know, will be overtaken by a book that then comes along in the future that does have access to materials that, um, you know, that the unauthorized biographer did. So I think, you know, it's really a true catch-22 for the biographer. And what most, I think what most serious biographers do is something like the arrangement that I wound up having with the Shirley Jackson estate um, Shirley Jackson's descendants, um, which was that um, they promised me their cooperation and that they were willing to sit for interviews and also to allow me to quote from um, her unpublished manuscripts and so on from her archive, um, but they did not, they were not allowed approval over the final manuscript. They were allowed to see it and to comment on it, but um, not to have final say over what went into it. And it, like, biographers, of course, know to read the author's note in every biography, which usually spells out the terms, you know, either directly or obliquely under which the book was written. I have a question, actually, so for Ruth, following up on that, which is um, when the Bailey book was being written about, before these other allegations came out, a lot, a lot of reviewers or people who wrote profiles made a song and dance of the fact that Bailey professed to have complete independence. So he professed to have this relationship with Philip Roth where he portrayed a relationship that was very close, that was almost like we're really good friends and I understand him and all this stuff. But he also was saying to the Times Magazine, like Philip respected me and like my independence. How, how difficult do you think that actually would be to do under the terms of an authorized biography like that. I mean, is that just kind of like a fantasy to say that you can do an authorized biography where you're actually like sitting down with that person all the time and be independent? 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's such an interesting question. I'll say, you know, I've never written a biography of somebody who is alive um, and, you know, didn't have the opportunity of um, asking all the kinds of questions that Blake Bailey obviously um, got to talk to Roth about, which, you know, on the one hand, that kind of access seems like a fantasy, right? It's incredible to be able to ask whatever you want. Most of the time, we're sitting here in the dark, you know, trying to divine <laughs> what somebody thought about something or other from, you know, long ago notes or letters or whatever. Um, you know, on the other hand, I think, and this is, you know, a more literary um, critique of the book that, you know, we can discuss, that, you know, the question to which that's kind of dangerous for the biographer in that the subject's voice can kind of take over. Um, and that, you know, leaving totally aside the question of um, maintaining your biographical independence, I think it must be very hard to maintain one's critical independence uh, in terms of, you know, just being able to hold on to your own narrative construction of the person's life, you know, your own interpretation and understanding of why they did the things they did and all that, you know, obviously it's always an interpretation. Um, but, you know, we, I don't have to say that we don't always understand our own motives. And, you know, you can see over and over again in Bailey's biography that, you know, Roth is telling him the reason he did something or other, and he is quoting it for us in the biography. And I keep wondering, well, are you sure? You know, what do, what, what do you think about that? Um, Laura, I was going to ask you um, uh, sort of a, a, a different version of what I was asking Ruth, but kind of as it pertains specifically to this biography. Um, uh, I was actually just going to read a, a little excerpt of uh, the review that you wrote, um, just to kind of give people like a, a, a taste of the kinds of um, imbrications that Roth had in the, um, the, the, the commissioning and, and kind of creation of his own biography. And so this is actually, um, this bit is about uh, Ross Miller, who's a friend or, or uh, became sort of an ex-friend of Roth, uh, who Roth uh, um, at, at one point was uh, interested in taking on as a biographer. He went through a, a, a whole kind of roster of people um, and uh, that didn't work out either because they didn't want to do it, which happened with, for example, Hermione Lee, or um, that fell apart for whatever reason. And, uh, and so this should just give you an idea of, of what that looked like in one case. So, um, so this is from, from Laura's review. Uh, Roth, however, seems to have gone out of his way to prevent a gentler story from being told. The parts of Bailey's book that trace the unraveling of Roth Miller's Roth biography are among its most revealing. Not long after signing the book deal, Miller came to suspect Roth of interference. Roth was actively involved in setting up interviews with friends, family, and collaborators, and was even drafting the questions that Miller was to ask them. In one case, it, he was directing Miller to ask a dying friend to yield up old gossip. Miller was also editing the Library of America edition of Roth's works, and Roth had inserted himself there too. As the editor, Miller was meant to provide a 10,000 word chronology of Roth's life, but Roth wrote it himself and signed Miller's name to it. He also wrote all the jacket copy himself, claiming he could do a better job. Um, obviously, there's uh, a lot, lot going on here. I think that that is striking to me, um, partly because even without getting into um, the kind of sexual politics of um, of his relationship with the uh, with with his biography um, uh, with his sort of vision for his biography and um, and of his relationship uh, with Bailey um, it already sketches you know the extent to which he was quite obsessive about um, trying to uh bring about a biography that um that that he wanted and so um so i wonder if you can say more about um 
uh, your understanding of kind of what he, what motivated him um, to try and intervene in the making of his biography to this extent and, um, you know, and, and, and how he did that? Um, well, yeah, first off, it is hard to understand because, for instance, tasks like writing jacket copy are not coveted tasks. <laughs> you know, like these are these are like difficult marketing exercises that I don't think anyone is super eager to kind of dig into. That there are people who are highly trained to do stuff like that. Um, so it is kind of bizarre that he ends up taking on these these tasks in the packaging of Library of America book and stuff. Um, it's, it's odd that he seems to have intervened so much. I actually found it the most interesting part of the Bailey biography, just this final section at the end, because the narrative of the late years of his life, especially when he's given up actually producing novels, is all directed towards basic, like curating his legacy and um, trying to shape the image that he'll have. And it's sort of like this weird story behind the story. It's not clear how revealing Bailey is, the author of the book, thinks um, these chapters are uh, as it concerns his own status, right, as the biographer. Because when you're reading it, or at least for me, reading it and seeing, okay, this person tried to do it their own way and they're discarded. And then this person comes in and they're discarded. And then if you're the person narrating that and, and you're saying, and I'm the guy who stuck around, like it sort of implies that, well, what did you agree to that Ross Miller didn't or, or whatever? Um, so it's kind of telling. I, and I mean, that is the experience of reading Philip Roth, the biography for me, um, was that often you just find yourself reading between the lines and I think that's because of the problem that Ruth just flagged, which is Rob's voice is so prominent in the book that often his statements are just being taken as like the story. This is what happened. They're not being treated the, the way that a quote from a book would be treated or a letter. You know, there's no, there isn't much of a sense of, oh, look, here are all these little sources and they're, they're conflicting in all these ways. And I, as the biographer, have like the fun task of picking through them, trying to reconcile them and rather than saying this is what happened, saying these are the tensions like that run through this life. These are the unresolved things that actually make up a life rather than, well, he did this and he said he was right to do it and he was right to do it. Um, so because, because it's so flat in that way as a narrative, as the reviewer or as a reader, I would suspect, you just often find yourself reading between the lines. Mm -hmm. And this story of the last few years of Roth's life you're just constantly reading between the lines because you keep being told he controls everything, he controls everything, he controls everything. And this book has, he's allowed this book to happen. So what are you missing? Yeah, I think that that's such a great point. And something else I noticed um, actually flipping back through it today was um, how few notes there are for a biography of this size. I mean, this is a 900 page biography and normally like I'm as a biographer I'm always looking at the footnotes because the story of how the book is written is in the footnotes you know you can piece that together um and Billy doesn't seem in many cases doesn't seem to have footnoted his interviews with Roth so a lot of the time in the text there's a quote from Roth you know, that is just, you know, presented as Roth said, like when, if he's writing something for, you know, for publication or elsewhere, usually that's flat, but there, you know, the book is full of, you know, Roth said without attribution or identification. And the, so the fact that the, I think the, and those, that's what's not flagged in the notes. So the, the fact that the notes are so comparatively slender, I think kind of shows how much of this book is on Roth. You know, as as one would say to a fact checker, right? Um, if you're, you know, if you're writing personal stories or profiles, sometimes things are just, you know, <laughs> that's on the subject. You know, when things can't be fact checked or proved in other ways, and so a lot of the book is is literally coming from Roth, which you know, in its own way, is amazing, right? It's it's an amazing piece of source material for everybody who's going to be dissecting it and analyzing it for, you know years and years to come. But, you know, it is not in any way a conventional biography. 
That's an interesting interpretation of the lack of notes thing, because that hadn't that hadn't occurred to me. I had noticed the kind of gappy notes where I would be going through a paragraph, like for fact checking the piece I wrote, and sometimes there'd only be one note in a graph that was full of facts and clearly different voices. Um, but the thing, the thing that tripped me up when I was going through was like um, there were many quotes that were tr attributed to Roth or were written as if Roth was saying, oh, I had this experience and here's what I thought. And then when you looked at the note, that's from a novel. Mm -hmm. And then there was even one where, and I quoted it in my review and had to take it out when I went and looked at the notes, was from a Saul Bellow novel. And mm -hmm. it was just inserted in, in the paragraph as if Philip Roth just had this thought. Not, oh, Philip Roth had read this novel and may, this may have been back of his mind. It was like literally quoted in there as if, Roth had a thought that was in a Sorbello novel. And so I just had sort of chalked it all up to really sloppy noting. Um, mm -hmm. And I wasn't sure if, it, it made me doubt actually how much of that is Roth, because if there's no note, right, we don't who know. knows, right? Um, but I do certainly think a lot of the book is on Roth in that um, there are these books Bailey had access to that no one's seen. And um, particularly this book, um, Notes uh, for my biographer, which he was going to publish. Um, like I see that as an unpublished work of Philip Roth. It's not, it's not a notebook. It's not something like, there's this other thing called Notes on a Slander Manga, which is about Russ Miller. And that seems like more of a set of notes or kind of angry dossier. But this book, Notes for my biographer was a book that was intended for publication. So it does seem like there is an actual unpublished work, something that could be truly considered an unpublished book that he had access to. And that seems to be, to be honest, it seems to be the voice of most of the book. If there is a presiding voice of the Philip Roth the biography. Certainly at least when he's talking about his, his ex wife The women, yeah. Um. Laura or, or, or either of you, um, do you want to just say, um, do you want to kind of explain like the, the, I guess, two different unpublished manuscripts that Roth wrote, one uh, about the, the slander, the slander monger, um, and the other about uh, Claire Bloom, or in response to Claire Bloom, um, and <laughs> the relationship that, um, that those manuscripts have to this biography? Um, yeah, I can, I can explain that quickly. Um, so Claire Bloom wrote a memoir called Leaving a Doll's House, which is like half of it's just about her life as an actress. And then the second half is about her relationship with Philip Roth and how it all broke down. Um, and he was very angry when this book was published, considered legal action, decided that that was too much, and then wrote a line by line rebuttal of the parts of the book that are about him. And he signed a book contract for that and had sold it for publication. Um, so that's like a complete work that was ready, that we would have read if it had not been for, I think, the intercession of some friends who who like persuade Roth not to publish this and Roth eventually listens to them. Um, so that's notes for my biographer. And then the other book is this thing called Notes, uh, notes on a Slander Manga. And that's kind of more of an informal thing. Um, so Ross Miller was making these tapes when he was preparing his biography of Philip Roth that never materialized. And Roth kind of got wind that he was, he was asking some very sort of like disrespectful questions about Philip Roth. And um, once Roth kind of dismissed him or cut him off, um, he went through the tapes and the notes and also did a rebuttal to those. Um, but that's more of a, that seems to be more of a kind of housekeeping exercise that, you know, he was gonna pass on to whoever he ended up anointing to take over that project. Um, so I think, um, I I mean, this in my mind sort of gets us toward um, the the place where Roth's and and Bailey's 
careers sort of uh, sort of particularly intersect, um, which is to say that that Roth had um, you know this obsession with his biography um, and was particularly concerned about the way that Bloom, who was his ex-wife, had portrayed him um, in uh, leaving a doll's house. Um, and then um, his selection of Bailey as a biographer um, also seems to have made its way into kind of the, the, um, the myth kind of surrounding the biography itself. Um, and I'm just gonna read one more excerpt. Um, this is actually from uh, Perul Segal's uh, review. Um, and I just think this will be helpful for those who uh, have not gotten in quite as deep here, uh, just to, to understanding why um, why the allegations against Bailey do seem to um, impinge on Roth in some way. Um, so this is just, I, I mean, all of this is, is quite like speculative, um, but, but I think that this might be a good indication. So, um, so the backdrop here is um, a conversation that uh, Bailey and Roth are having about the actress Ally McGraw and Roth saying, she's really hot and Bailey saying like, why didn't you ask her out? You told, you know, like you could have had a chance with her um, and Roth saying like, all right, kid, you're hired essentially. Um, and so then, so, so, so the review picks up here. Um, and I was, he was totally serious. Bailey said, this is Bailey speaking at a panel discussion a couple of years before the biography came out. Um, so Bailey added, just as important a literary qualification for a biographer as knowing where he fits into the literary continuum with Malamud and Bello and so forth is not taking too prim or judgmental of a view of a man who had this florid love life. Uh, and Perul's review goes on. Uh, it was perhaps the, the credential that mattered most, this feeling of complicity. At just under 900 pages, the book is mostly is most thoroughly a sprawling apologia for Roth's treatment of women on and off the page and a minutely detailed account of his victimization at the hands of his two wives. Um, so, so that's, I think, um, where it becomes really hard to, um, to know kind of where to draw the line between Roth's obsession with his own um, representation and the and the kind of particular um, uh, complicity or um, uh, or 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 intimacy over closeness or something um, that that seems to um, have struck some of us at least in, um, in, in reading this biography or reading about it, um, or, or that's, that's sort of my read at least. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm curious about um, if either of you, you know, wanted to jump off of that or, um, uh, or just more broadly, like, uh, you know, is it, is it um, fair to think about the allegations against Bailey implicating Roth in some way. I mean, it's just such an odd situation, right? Like the 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 biographical subject, um, kind of in in some way being erased as a biographical subject uh, by his biographer's own um, alleged wrongdoings. Um, it's, I, I find it quite hard to wrap my head around, actually. Um, and I think it also, you know, um, I can't help but think, you know, feels like a Philip Roth novel. There's something about the, the kind of like, uh, uh, there's something quite like metafictional about it, I want to say. Um, and um, yeah, and I just wonder what, um, how, how either of you are thinking about that. 
But, uh, you know, along the lines of it being like a Philip Roth novel, I'll confess that I have the thought that, you know, well, Blake Bailey must have really done something to piss off Philip Roth for him to be exactly this kind of revenge from beyond the grave. You know, he knew that this was, <laughs> this was possible. Um, but, you know, and on the question of whether it, you know, how it reflects on him, I think, honestly, I feel like the only way it reflects on Roth really is that I think that he showed poor judgment in his choice of the Um Clearly, he did that multiple times, actually, <laughs> at least um, so we can, if, if, you know, we can judge from from the account. And, you know, I, I um, am on record as saying that I, I heard Blake Bailey tell that story, too, about um, how it was, uh, you know, his, they bonded over their mutual admiration of Alan McGraw. And I, and I wrote that, you know, it, it broke my heart, you know, as a biographer and a critic and a woman, like, there are moments, you know, a lot of them when you see the doors that are closed to you. And for me, hearing Blake Bailey tell that story was one of, was a moment that I saw that closed door. It was just was so clear to me that, um, you know, this, and it's, you know, it's not clear what happened with Hermione Lee or whatever, but that, you know, this wasn't a door that a woman was going to walk through or whatever, for whatever reasons. And, um, so, and, and, you know, it just, as, as, as a biographer, it, it feels to me that that's, that's not the way that such decisions should be made, you know, and that, you know, that said, I think that there are more important things than whether one is, you know, um, on the surface, superficially, like one's subject. Um, you know, I think more important that, you know, Blake Bailey isn't Jewish for one thing, you know, more important than those kind of categories of, of identity are a kind of affinity between subject and biography. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, surely that's, certainly that's what I felt for Shirley Jackson when I was writing my book. I didn't have much in common with her on the surface, but I, I felt a very um, deep kind of emotional connection, um, you know, partially based on our shared experience of you know raising children while trying to have an intellectual and creative life, um, and so you know I don't want to get too deeply into what kind of how where the affinities between Bailey and Roth are drawn, but you know it, it strikes me that um, you know there if if Roth was looking for somebody to be sympathetic to him rather than, you know, to give him, you know, and, and that's not to say, you know, I think obviously there are many, there are lots of moments of uh, what seem to be real honesty in Bailey's book. And, you know, it's certainly not like a sugar-coated picture of Roth at all. There are many moments where he's displayed, you know, with a lot of, of ugliness and cruelty. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting it's not an honest portrayal in that way. Um, but that Bailey's sympathy for certain aspects of Roth's personality may have made it difficult for him to see the other side of the story. Yeah, I mean, when I was reading it, I kept thinking about the Hermione Lee biography that might have been, um, because any biography by Hermione Lee is an event. Um, and Hermione Lee writing about Philip Roth, who she had known for decades, would have been really interesting. And I think that um, you know, it would have been interesting to have someone who was sympathetic to the subject, but who also wasn't going to fall into the trap of trying to sort of justify their behavior. Um, and I think ultimately a book like that, and, and obviously I don't know what she would have written because she would have gone off and had to shape that narrative, but a book like that would have done a service to his legacy in that you don't have to hide things, but you can put the emphasis elsewhere. So it would be fine to sort of admit the things that Roth had done that were questionable, but also to, to throw the emphasis back on his artistry, um, his friendships, which are kind of, don't really come to life in the Bailey book. There are friends on the scene that you don't really understand what those friendships meant to Roth and how they supplied him with a with an inner life and, and a creative dialogue. Um, and so I kept thinking of what that would have been like. Um, 
And I, and I think there is a clue in the book as to why that may not have worked for her, um, which is that she did the Paris Review interview for the Prague. And there's a long account of him basically like rewriting the whole thing. <laughs> and I just think, I, I don't know anything about her decision-making process, but if I were in that situation, that's not workable creatively. Like you can't be working on a long biography of someone where they want to have that kind of input. It's just not, it's not viable. Um, and so I wonder if beyond the kind of like bonding over, oh, isn't this actress hot? There's also just, what are you willing to do? Like what kinds of conditions, creative conditions are you willing to work under? And, and I'm sure that that put other people off too. Yeah, although in fairness, that is the standard for Paris Review interviews. Uh, you know, the subject always mm -hmm. gets to have a final say over what goes at those interviews, which I agree is a very strange and controlling editorial decision. But yeah, I think, you know, there are a lot of missed opportunities in the Blake Bailey book, you know, the friendships, but also just more about his literature. Um, you know, aside from identifying, you know, the sources for different characters, we don't really get a great sense of where these books came from. And I think, you know, that's kind of, that's really the most sort of ineffable thing about any biography of a creative person, right? Is trying to figure out what it was that made them create the art that they made. But I think, you know, I think that's that's where the, the deepest interest lies. And I was sorry to see that Blake Bailey didn't like go there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if the book offers anything um, remotely approaching a theory of how the events of the life are feeding into new books, it's really just, oh, new girlfriend, new character pops up. And it, you almost get the impression that Roth is dating in order to acquire source material for dialogue and for characters in his books, which is a really crude reading. I'm not saying that that's what he did, but that's really one of the only readings that you could come away from this biography with because it's just woman after woman after woman, and then, oh, book after book after book, and this person is this person, and this person is this person, and this line of dialogue actually goes into the novel and so forth. Yeah, I mean, as interesting as all that is, I mean, I do, I do find that kind of, you know, it's fascinating to know that Maxine Grofsky was the model for Brenda Potemkin, but like, we all know that that's not how artists and writers really work, you know, things, are, things aren't just taken from life and stuck in the books, they're transformed in different ways, and the transformation is what makes it, you know, is what makes it interesting, what makes it meaningful. Right. Um, Ruth, I, I was curious about something um, that, that you had mentioned a few minutes ago um, about, uh, you know, just thinking more broadly about, about biography um, and, uh, and wondering what do you think, I mean, this is kind of what you get into in, um, in that op-ed, but, but, um, but reflecting on it now, what do you think is, um, uh, what do you think are kind of the underlying conditions in, in the publishing industry or in the literary world or, 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 uh, or wherever um, that are creating a situation where, um, this can happen, um, or, or, um, and 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 what do you think you would want to see change um, in order to, um, I don't know, kind of have a literary world where uh, where this where this doesn't happen? Yeah, I mean, I talked, to, I read a little bit about how there's always this kind of weird courtship ritual that's enacted between the subject or the estate. And a would-be biographer where you know the biographer woos the estate and kind of try, you know has to prove their worth um and you know eventually gets um betrothed and all that um and the fact is that you know you have to have a certain um, there have to be certain connections that just exist in order for a biographer even to get their foot in the door i mean you have to understand how this works for one thing you know there's no manual for biographers that explains um, how to go about this. So, you know, there's, it's just, it's a, the literary world, you know, in general is, you know, very much based on 
networking and you know being in the right place and asking the right question at the right time and all that and i think the wor world of biography even more so um so yeah as i argued i would really love to see um as a situation of more open access to writers papers you know yes on the one hand i totally understand why um artists and their estates want to control who has access to personal papers and you know there are mechanisms in public archives for doing that um you know rather than giving things to people to keep in their personal possession you know in their attic or wherever um you know if we believe that scholarly papers are important you know the, this is this is where our literary history is kept this is where it lives and this is how we tell the stories of, you know, the artists and writers and whoever who explain what it is to be an American, right? In so many ways, that's what Roth did. Um, you know, if we believe these stories are important, they have to be protected and preserved in a way that makes them open and accessible. Do you think, um, just sort of practically speaking, um, that what do you think should happen to the archives now um, that have come out of, um, of Bailey's research? I mean, do you, do you see them as being um, kind of fair game for future biographers to use? Um, this is also, Really, oh, sorry, what? Yeah, my short answer is yes, absolutely. Yeah. 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 They should, I think they should, um, you know, exist under the rules that govern the vast majority of archives, which is that they're open to anybody who wants to take the time and has the wherewithal to travel there and do the research and read it. And the question of publishing stuff from those archives is more complicated. And that's what one generally needs to apply for permission for. I'm not arguing that like everything should be totally, you know, digitized and broadcast over WikiLeaks for the entire world to see or whatever. Um, but yeah, I think I, I believe that um, writers' papers are important and should be available for people to, to do research on, that they you know, they can fundamentally change our understanding of literature. One, you know, one little example of that is the T.S. Eliot letters to his longtime um, girlfriend, partner, um, Emily Hale, which have been kept sealed for decades and were just reopened um, last year, right before the pandemic started. And they revealed all kinds of things about Eliot's poetry that nobody had known before, including, you know, sources for lines, sources for mysterious figures that nobody had been able to identify. And clearly these letters are going to change the way that a lot of Alan's poetry is read and understood. And if you know they had been handed over to a single biographer who had the instructions to destroy them afterward, all that would be lost. Yeah, I think that that last instruction is really puzzling, right? Because it kind of implies the idea that, say there's a set of texts and they just have one meaning. So one person can consult them, get the meaning, put it in the biography and then they can be destroyed. And that's just so bizarre to me because obviously 10 different people who are really informed could read this and come up with at least 10 different really fruitful readings of Roth. Like it isn't like, it's just like, oh, well, he wrote a note saying like, this is what happened. Uh, so it, once you found that, that's the info. Um, there, there clearly is a need, even, even if the authorized biographer were to sort of get there first and get take the most interesting stuff or be the first person to publish certain things, there would be such a value in subsequent biographers being able to access it. Yeah. Right. Uh, uh, everything we know about reading how it <laughs> right but also just writers are notoriously bad at interpreting their own books you know they often the critics and you know readers critics scholars often come up with ideas that writers aren't able to articulate that yeah i i i have to say i think that this is a lot of what's um 
uh, sort of gotten under my skin about this entire thing is that um, uh, just just the idea of uh, Roth's um, kind of uh, al almost like a metaphysical seeming commitment to the idea of an authorized biography um, just seems so uh it seems so kind of myopic and and like telling in a way um like almost almost like capital t tragic or something um uh in the sense that like i mean i guess very much as um as you were both saying the idea that like that you could have the final word on an author or that an author can, you know, sort of engineer the final word on themselves, um, just seems so kind of inimical to the way that I think we all know writing works and like uh, life writing works, and and it's so it just feels like such a, a a very striking blind spot for Roth to have had about himself. I think this is again what feels, you know, sort of. Um, uh, uh, Rothian again about the whole thing, right? Like it, it seems like the kind of thing that he would have um, been interested in as a kind of form of hubris or like literary problem if 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 it was somebody else doing it, and yet it was him. Um, and 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 I was just going to add also, you know, I think that the um, the fact that that Roth chose, um, you know, this sort of like a uh, like genteel kind of waspy biographer. Um, uh, I sort of read as um, a, a, an attempt to get that kind of final seal of approval um, from, you know, from from like American arts and letters like that, you know, you are not you are not a uh, a, 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 a niche Jewish writer, you are, you know, the second coming of Henry James or whatever he imagined himself when he was in that kind of mode. And, um, and, and, and so that, I, I mean, I guess that's the part of it that I've, that I, I really just um, find so striking is, is that that would be the thing uh, that would, that, that, that that seems to itself have been perhaps part of um, the bad judgment that that you know enabled this situation again like very much a speculative um, uh, reading and perhaps I'm getting too carried away with myself for uh, you know with uh, with imagining what could have been like going on in his head but. Um, yeah, I do find it kind of hard not to see that. I don't know how much uh, he was looking for a non-Jewish biographer or if that just mm -hmm. fell into his lap. Right. But I do think I really appreciated Judith Shulovitz's review of the book mm -hmm. um, because I think she highlighted some of the ways in which the biography really failed to locate Roth as a Jewish writer at all. Like you don't have to go all out and you know presenting him as a Jewish writer, but there is this this part that I underlined when I was reading the book where he like does this um, sort of like potted description of what Judaism is. And I was just reading it thinking, that's so weird. Like anyone who's read a novel by Philip Roth doesn't need, you know, it literally says, um, the law was embodied by rabbis. It's like so bizarre. Um, and, you know, I had been hesitating to, to review the book because I am I thought, oh, there's so many American Jewish writers who could do this, who would have so much more context. And then when I read that, I was like, you know what? I, I have the authority to review this book because I know more about this. this, this aspect of Philip Roth than his biographer does. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say that, you know, Roth would have needed a Jewish biographer to really get at what he means in the context of the culture of American Judaism. But I think the, you know, the full scope of it, it does not really come out in this book at all. And yeah, you see Bailey's lack of familiarity with Judaism and 
some kind of atrocious ways. Um, I'm, um, I'm looking at the, the questions that have come up here and I wanted to, um, want to just pull out a couple of threads here. Um, a, a few people have asked about how the two of you see the, the publishing story here. Um, uh, one person asked, uh, um, whether you think that Norton did the right thing in withdrawing the book from publication. Um, another person asked uh, how you see the role of publishers doing their due diligence before publishing authors. Um, how much responsibility do you think that Norton has in this case or, or that publishers have in general um, for uh, things that can come out about their writers. Um, yeah, why don't, why don't we just leave it there for now? And um, yeah, do you wanna speak to either of those? I think part of what, you know, rubs a lot of people the wrong way about the way this whole thing played out is because, in, you know, in some ways it seems so random, you know, this, and, and that's, that's true for the, for the Me Too movement, I think in general, right? Some alleged predators get called out. And we know that there are many more of them out there who aren't, right? Um, Harvey Weinstein is, you know, becomes the fall guy. And yet, you know, how many more directors and producers and actors are there who have also engaged in predatory behavior who we just don't know about, right? And so it feels like that kind of censorship falls, um, you know, arbitrarily, I guess, or, you know, without, without the needed, um, it, it, un, un, unfairly when it happens to some, but not all. Um, and so, you know, do, do publishers, are, are publishers, you know, responsible for the um, moral um, characters of all the authors they publish? Well, obviously not, right? We know that that's an absurdity. Um, we know that artists and writers throughout history have done and said the most appalling things. And it generally doesn't affect the way we think about their work in retrospect or, you know, in posterity. You know, that said, you know, when I think someone, a publisher receives direct allegations of something that an author has done, that's what changes the calculus a little bit. And, you know, that I think, that's where it becomes problematic. And the, the withdrawal of the book isn't as much a judgment of the allegations against Bailey, but of the way um, Norton chose to handle them. Um. Uh, one other question somebody asked um, that's related um, is about the current status of Bailey's biography. Um, the reason that I kind of hesitated um, at, the, at the very beginning of this conversation about saying that the book has been taking, taken out of circulation is that um, it is being reprinted by Skyhorse, which is um, a small publisher that uh, as far as I understand, has basically made a, a kind of business model out of um, this exact kind of situation. So uh, when a book by Woody Allen was uh, um, cut from publication uh, from a major publisher, they picked up that book uh, or they published, uh, um, you know, people like uh, uh, Alan Dershowitz, for example, like, but you know, but like recently. Um, and so I, um, so yeah, I wonder if, if anyone's able to speak more to that or to this kind of particular uh, strange model of, um, of, of books that get kind of taken back up um, as, you know, in this kind of like, uh, contrarian strike against cancel culture kind of uh, kind of mode. 
Well, I think that it speaks to the fact that the book was never unpublished. So there was a long, kind of a big scare about it. It's, it's so awful if a book is unpublished because of allegations against the author. And I think that's a serious question um, and one that probably would need more extended debate than we saw over what happened with Blake Bailey. But that didn't happen in this case. The publisher dropped the book. It seems largely their decision was informed by their own role and their own handling of allegations they'd received, which is what Ruth just said. Um, and then it was picked up by another publisher. I think I, I'm not aware that there's been a time um, in the last several months when if you wanted a copy of that book, you wouldn't be able to get it because Amazon had them in inventory, the ebook was available um, and audiobook edition was never taken out of circulation because the rights had been handled differently. Um, so I think it, it all just sort of adds up to the, it all works against the notion that this book was somehow turned into a non-book. It's existed the whole time, it still exists. Um, and I think people who want to consult it, you know, because it contains information that other works don't and that other people haven't been able to access, they're free to do so. Yeah, the book is, continues to be on sale at Amazon and has been every single time I happen to look for it there, just, you know, just out of curiosity. The, you know, the, what, what it means that Norton withdrew the book, I, I don't totally understand. I mean, it's not like they pulped it. They don't, it's not like they made bookstores return it. The book has always been out there, which, you know, again, I, I'm not sure that we can get into all the implications of it now, but, you know, the, the issue isn't whether the book, you know, deserves to be out in the world as a resource for scholars, which, you know, by the way, it would still be in libraries, presumably, even if it were withdrawn from circulation, which is who should be profiting from it, right? I think that's that's the question that we can't, we can't really answer. Um, I'll just ask one more thing, which is, um, uh, again, sort of trying to pick up a, a few different threads that, that um, have come up in the Q&A, a number of questions are um, are actually about your views on uh, on Roth novels uh, or on sort of like Roth's artistic legacy. Um, I, I know I had said at the very beginning, um, you know, that I think the question of why or if we should care about Roth himself is, you know, I think. Um, had to be a little bit bracketed, um, right, to like have this conversation. Uh, but now that we're at the end, I'm curious what you think, um, you know, whether whether either of you have sort of answers to that, whether they've changed at all, um, uh, it, reading more about his life and, 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 um, and, and, writing about him in this context. Um, but like, yeah, I guess just what, you know, kind of why, wh uh, why, why read Philip Roth now? Or like, you know, do you, is that something that people um, uh, should be doing as like, a, I mean, just like on a, on a literary level, like what is, what does Roth mean to you? Well, I think if it weren't worth re still worth reading Philip Roth now, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. I mean, that's yeah. the only reason there has been such an uproar over this book is because it is that that part demonstrates Roth's continued importance, just, you know, out of the sheer amount of passion that so many readers feel about his work and his legacy. You know, regardless of what either of us might personally think about him, he's a giant in American letters of the last, you know, 50, 60 uh, years and that's that's not you know that's not going to be changed by a scandal like this so yeah I think you know I was actually trying to explain to one of my teenagers before we started here um, the significance of, of Philip Roth and I said you know that for a, a generation of people he explained to them what it meant to be a Jew in America and I think you know there are a lot of people who for better or for worse um, met Jews through Philip Roth's novels, you know, maybe for the first time, or understood, 
Jewish culture in a different way. And I'm, you know, I'm not saying that that was his only subject, but I think in a lot of ways that was his greatest subject and that he, he did it in a, in a different way, you know, a more complex way, um, a, a truly, you know, honest and unforgiving way that nobody before him had, had really tried to do. Do you want me to also answer that? I wasn't sure if you were waiting. Yeah, yeah, go for I it. I agree with everything Ruth said. I, I certainly wouldn't have bothered engaging with the Blake Bailey biography at all if I didn't want to find out something about Philip Roth. I, I think um, I was dismayed when I published the review, like the first reaction it got, what some people would say, never reading Philip Roth again, what a piece of work. And I was kind of like, oh, that was, that wasn't the point of the piece at all. And, and maybe that's something for me to bear in mind in the future would, would be to make that more clear, though I think I tried to in the way I wrote the piece. Um, the books haven't changed. Like those are the, those are the reasons we're interested in Philip Roth. The books haven't changed. Um, with that said, I was more enthusiastic about Roth before I started reading the Bailey biography, purely because I wasn't really interested in his feuds with his wives. And I wasn't interested in, um, you know, the, the parts of him that people have tended to look at with a slightly jaundiced mm. expression. Um, and I was hoping, I think I was hoping for a biography with, that would throw the emphasis somewhere more interesting. Mm. And this biography wasn't that. So I came out feeling kind of disappointed, but that's definitely not to say that it lowered for the broth in my estimation as a novelist. I think it will just take some time to kind of step away from the voice that came through in the book. The, the voice that was emphasized was the notes from my biographer Roth, not, you know, the novelist. Um, okay, great. Well, um, uh, unless either of you have questions for each other, I think we can wrap up. I probably have many, but I can, I can <laughs> ask them some other time. I'm sorry to hear that people, you know, were turned off from Roth by your review. I guess I'm a little, I'm a little surprised by that. It was clear to me that you were doing the biography and not Roth as a person. You know, as a reader, I would say like, I wasn't really, there wasn't anything in the book that, in Bailey's biography that shocked me about Roth, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, as a reader of his novels, I wasn't expecting him to have been a great husband. Um, you know, I had some. <laughs> obsessed that he you know uh, he had a lot of you know relationships with women of different quality and uh, duration and all that and yeah I, I agree with you that that that's not my area of greatest interest in his life either but it wasn't like I was expecting him to be a choir boy and you know the scales fell from my eyes you know yeah yeah no I think and I think that's that was the other reaction I got which was like well so what we already knew this uh, so it's sort of a weird line and I think that it's one of the reasons Philip Roth is hard to write about is that there's like one group of people who don't want you to say anything bad about him because they assume that you want to stop people reading him and then there's another group of people who are like well he was uh, you know awful to women and therefore you shouldn't read him and I think like it's it's difficult to write something that will not provoke those reactions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, that's, I think that's not what we're looking for in literature. I mean, certainly I'm not looking for somebody who satisfies some kind of political or social or moral litmus test. I think, you know, that's what's great about Roth is his complexity. And sometimes that complexity goes places that I don't like. Um, and that's what makes him interesting as a novelist, right? We're not just looking to have our own views confirmed. Mm -hmm. Well, I see that we're over time. I mean, I'd be happy to go on talking about Phil <laughs> But, you know, I would love to, I'm on, I'm on Twitter. I know Laura is too. I'd be happy to continue this conversation there for those who are interested. I see there are a lot of questions here that we didn't get to. So, yeah, I'll just invite people to feel free to seek me out that way. Um, okay, great. Well, um, thank you uh, so much, Ruth and Laura, and thank you everybody for coming and um, have a uh, 